Hi everyone, my name is David Howie from University of Oxford and today I'm going to be speaking about data-driven battery health diagnosis in real-world applications. This work was mainly done by my PhD student, Antti Atio, so I'd like to give him full credit for all of the effort that's been put in here. The key result that I really want to discuss is a technique that we've developed to extract state of health information from live operational data with our partner BeeBox, um, who have provided the data. And from this, we can identify failing batteries before they fail. As an aside, in general, the methods I'm about to describe work on all different kinds of batteries. Uh, in this talk, I'll discuss lead acid, but this method is equally applicable to lithium ion systems. OK, we can all appreciate that batteries are prone to failure. You picture the scene, you've just dropped off something uh, and you need to drive home. You put the key in your car, turn it on, nothing happens. And this, in fact, uh, happened to me about a year ago way back when I still had a combustion engine vehicle. Um, and of course, it was pretty easy to fix this at the time. We, we, we just needed a jump start. Um, but you can imagine that if you've got a whole fleet full of batteries in a grid energy storage system, uh, assets worth millions or a fleet of electric buses um, or off-grid systems, then this kind of failure um, can be a much bigger problem uh, from a logistics point of view, but also warranties, insurance, and so on. And so knowing how you're doing is, and knowing how you're doing and being able to predict uh, failure is a really important thing to be able to do. And we can sort of split this into two things, um, what are called diagnostics, which is what's happening right now, and then prognostics, which is what's happening in the future. And in this talk, I'm mainly going to talk about diagnostics. Degradation of batteries is a complex issue. There are lots of different things that um, go on. Um, and this picture shows some of the different um, mechanisms in lithium ion batteries. They range from electrochemical, like the SEI layer growth, through to mechanical. And all of these me mechanisms tend to interact with each other. Um, for the user, this mainly manifests as capacity fade and power fade. Um, and it's driven by extremes of temperature, extremes of state of charge, and that kind of thing. And modeling all of these different interactions, different mechanisms is difficult. Um, there are lots of different approaches ranging from physical models through to data-driven approaches. Um, but a key challenge I think is how do you actually do this in a real world scenario with real application data from the field, which is what I wanna focus on next. So, um, when we first started working on trying to diagnose battery health from real data, we thought it would be easy because after all, in the lab, there are lots of techniques that are available for measuring battery health. For example, we can just directly measure capacity and resistance. We could use EIS, we can do post-mortem analysis and so on. But in the lab, of course, conditions are usually quite well controlled. Whereas in the field, um, if we wanna do state of health diagnostics, um, the raw data is much more challenging. So um, for example, here we see 18 months of voltage measurements from a lead acid battery from B-Box. And first of all, I'd say that the sensors are less accurate. A lab current sensor might have an accuracy of 0.1%. In the field, that would be too expensive. So um, you would have a less accurate sensor. You'd have, in this case, non-uniform sampling. You'd have some strange gaps, like you can see here, there's a kind of a, a gap um, in this region where the system was just left. Um, and you can see that charge and, and, and discharge are not well controlled. If we zoom in, um, we can see the current voltage, temperature, and state of charge changing over a short period of time. And uh, you can see that it's still quite messy. We don't have kind of controlled um, CCCV charging. These systems are charged from solar. So it's a difficult problem. And I'd say that um, trying to diagnose battery state of health in this kind of scenario is a bit like searching for a needle in a haystack, but without even fully knowing what a needle actually looks like. So in general, if you look through the literature on this, uh, there's a good 15 years or so of, of literature. Um, people tend to use feedback techniques with, with model-based estimation um, to solve these kinds of problems. And this is how it works. Uh, we have the real battery here in pink, and then we build in a computer model, um, a model of the battery, typically an equivalent circuit model. We measure the current, feed that into the battery model, 
and then estimate things like voltage, maybe temperature, and then compare the estimate to the real voltage and feed back the difference um, into the model. And by using this negative feedback, we can drive the model states to be uh, similar to the real battery states. And then this, we can use it to estimate things like state of charge and state of health. Now we could put different kinds of models into the blue box, but the typical model is an equivalent circuit, which would look something like this. This is probably the simplest kind of equivalent circuit model. Um, we don't have time to do a deep dive on this, but for those who are interested, these are the equations. This is a state space um, system. And um, just to point out that there are two states in this system, U1, which is the voltage over the RC pair, and U2, which is the state of charge. And the key thing is there are also some parameters and we can use these feedback techniques to track not only the states, but also the parameters. So in this case, the parameters we're interested in are the capacity Q, um, which is the battery's amp hour capacity and also the resistance, the internal resistance. And actually for many batteries, um, internal resistance is a very good health metric. In fact, if you look at the literature, um, people typically use capacity or resistance, but actually they're, they're usually quite well correlated. So here you can see some data um, where as the capacity on the top graph fades, the resistance is increasing pretty much um, in the uh, symmetric shape. Um, so we thought, okay, well, with our data, it's easy to measure resistance for various reasons, which I won't have time to go into. But um, so we, we, we just ran a simple least squares estimate of the resistance. And our first attempts to do that produced a graph that looked like this, really bad, um, doesn't work at all. And the question is, why is that? Uh, so let's drill into that in a bit more detail. And even actually when you, when you average this, so you can see it's gradually going up over time, but it's still very noisy. And when you average it, it's still kind of a mess. That's the, the red. So uh, the reason is pretty straightforward, actually. Unfortunately, um, there are some gremlins and the big gremlin with resistance is that it's not just a function of the battery's age or state of degradation. It's actually also a strong function of instantaneous temperature, state of charge and current. So you can imagine the resistance um, being a surface like this shown on the left. In this case, I've got resistance as a function of T, which is kind of time uh, and X, which is state of charge. And you can imagine if I just, don't correct for the fact that it's not only a function of time, but also state of charge. It's gonna be wandering all over the place like this video shows. So you can see here, state of charge is kind of going up and down all the time. Um, and as we progress through time, if we ignore that state of charge variation, we're gonna see something quite messy. But if we take it into account and learn the shape of this surface, we can then take a slice through that surface and that gives us the orange curve, which is much smoother. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, what, we, what we wanted to do is try and use these model-based techniques, but uh, use resistance as a health metric, but we need to somehow correct for the fact that there is this instant variability of state of charge and current and temperature, etc. So we actually, in this case, combined a um, simple circuit model approach with a machine learning approach, and the machine learning approach is what we use to learn the shape of this function for resistance. And um, machine learning is very good at learning functions from data. So what we did here is we just extract, express the resistance as a function of time, temperature, state of charge, current, et cetera. Um, and then we use a technique called um, Gaussian process regression, um, which I won't go into, but I'll show you some of the results to do this. So these are actually simulated results. On the left-hand side, we have a drive cycle with um, a vehicle speed, simulated voltage and state of charge. And if we uh, repeat this a number of times and kind of degrade the battery in a, in a fake way and reduce its resist, sorry, reduce its capacity and increase its resistance, um, we can then generate a whole string of synthetic data. And what we wanna do is then learn the degradation from that data. So we fit this series resistance to, to that data using this recursive Gaussian process implementation. And here are the results. And so what you can see here is um, uh, the ground truth is shown in, in red. So that's, we, we know what the truth is because this is just a model-based um, uh, kind of study. Um, and then the blue shows the mean and the variance of our estimates. And what this is showing is the resistance, which is our health metric, both as a function of time on this top axis um, and as a function of state of charge on the bottom axis. And what's really cool about this is that actually, 
we only observe the state of charge range between about 40% and 75%, but we can still extrapolate the behavior beyond that um, quite smoothly. And that's one of the big advantages of these GPs. We can also extrapolate the health into the future by um, a small amount in this case. Okay, so the technique seems to work well in um, simulation, but what about on real data? So here's some real data. So this is about a year and a half's worth of lead acid battery voltage data at the top. And what this video shows is how we can actually learn the shape of the resistance as a function of first the acid concentration, then the current, then the temperature, and then time. And you can see it's quite it's quite interesting because what we see is something like a butler volmer type expression coming out in the current, so that's the red one. We see some kind of uh, state of charge vari variability, as you might expect. Um, and then we can take a slice through at known conditions to get a sort of steady comparison, apples to apples comparison over time, and then use that, for example, uh, to do fault detection. So we could say, well, let, let's say if if that passes a certain fault threshold, then we could flag that there's been a problem. So we're currently working on thousands of data sets like this and trying to correlate our estimates with known repair information from BBOX's database. Okay, so take home messages from this talk. First of all, battery health diagnosis is a valuable thing to do. It can save people money, improve the user experience, avoid oversizing systems, etc. Secondly, field data sets as distinct from lab are really tricky. They don't behave well, there are gaps and there are lots of dependencies and things that we have to worry about. Um, as Ben Hamner from Kaggle said, analyzing data and machine learning is 1% writing code, 9% figure out why code doesn't work and 90% figure out what's wrong with the data. That's definitely the case here. And I might add what's wrong with our assumptions. And then finally, we need to uh, use techniques which can cope with gaps with, uh, can cope with uncertainty. And uh, that's why we've chosen methods which basically combine machine learning and model-based techniques here to learn a function from data. All right, that's all I have time for, but just to leave you with this last slide, the place that we're gonna go next is to scale this up. We're currently looking at about 1,100 systems, but there are hundreds of thousands of systems out there and that's actually a real big data challenge. We can do things to learn population models um, and uh, we can look at how batteries across 100,000 systems behave or how one particular battery compares to the population. We can compare manufacturers to other manufacturers and all kinds of stuff like that. So it's a really interesting and exciting area. So with that, I'll close. My email address and website is here and Twitter. Um, and I'd like to thank Faraday Institution for funding and BeeBox for um, uh, access to their data. Thank you.